when purpose is revealed, all falls into place. The revelation of purpose gives meaning to everything. And there is a purpose in this wonderful vast creation of God. Paul said, he has made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. There is a plan behind it all. Now let us turn to the most disputed verse in Ecclesiastes. God has put eternity into man's mind. Yet so, that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. The meaning of the word translated eternity would determine what meaning you would give to that verse. It's the third chapter, the eleventh verse. The word is olam. The King James Version translates it as the world. It put the world into man's mind. The Revised Standard Version translated as eternity. But the word is olam. It really means in a sense history. But history to the one who wrote it, the teacher, consists of all the generations of men including their experiences and all fused into one grand whole. And this concentrated time into which all things are fused, they call eternity. It is from this that all things spring, and now that is in your mind. All the generations that ever walked the face of this earth, all of their experiences, all that are walking today, all that ever will walk, God placed in your mind. You are not limited to this small little section of time, three score in ten years. He took eternity, therefore he gave you himself. But he hid the gift from the beginning of time to the end. The gift, his gift, is God himself. Believe it, and the whole incredible story of the gospel will become to you possible. And the day will come you will experience the gift, and you will know how true it is. God's purpose is to give himself to you individually, as though there were no others in the world, just you. For the gift is so complete, it is not you and God. It's you as God. God became as you are, that you may be as he is. So in the end you will not see another as God. It is you as God. This is the story. Now in the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes, the very end of the fourth chapter. He said, I saw all the living that move about under the sun, as well as that second youth who was to stand in his place. There was no end to all the people. He was above all of them. Yet, those who will come later will take no joy in him. Isn't that also vanity and the striving after wind? This second one spoken of in scripture is the Lord from heaven. It begins in the very beginning of Genesis. The second one was Abel, the slaughtered, the murdered. He moved through, the second one was Isaac, not Ishmael, the first. We come all through, it was Jacob, 
not Esau. A strange reversal of order takes place in all these adumbrations in Scripture. They're all foreshadowing of what God has planned for us. There is that second use in us that is, has to be awakened, and that is God himself. He is reproducing in us his own image. And that is called the second man, or the Lord from heaven. I will share with you, as I've done night after night, my own personal experience of Scripture. The story is the only true story in the world. God's eternal purpose is taking place in time. But it is an eternal state. It's something that is continuous. It is permanent. In contrast to this fragmented state in time, where we seem to begin, and all things that begin there, end. But there is something that does not begin. It is continuous. It is in man. It is buried in man. And that that cannot begin or end is God in man. As Paul asked the question, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Well, the answer to that, if you are honest with yourself, if you have not had the experience, you will say, no, I do not. I could believe it, and I will believe it, but I do not know it. For to experience it would be to know it. Not to experience it, and only to believe it, would be hearsay. But I want to actually experience it, that I may know it. Your purpose in this world is not what the world thinks it is. Therefore they say, you do not rejoice. Those who come later will not rejoice in him. Because they think their purpose is to make a fortune, to get a bigger house or more houses, to get a name among those who are departing this world. For all things appear, they wax, they wane, they disappear. No matter how long they prolong it or they think they do, they all vanish. And they want to have some name among the shadows that are vanishing. There is a purpose. And the purpose is to awaken as God. God himself. The plan is definite in scripture. For I've come into the world only to fulfill scripture. That's my purpose. He who began a good work in me will bring it to completion at the unveiling in me of his plan, which is Christ Jesus. He will unveil Christ Jesus in me, for when he does, I am he. I've been taught that he dwells in me, but I've also been taught that he came from without. When one experiences the story, he realizes he is not from without at all. He was always buried in me, that universal Christ, the cosmic Christ. The whole of it, not a little piece of it. But the whole is buried in the seeming part. And that individual, speaking to you now individually, will one day have the experience recorded in Scripture of Jesus Christ. He said, I am not of this world. I am from above. You are from below. He isn't speaking to the crowd on the outside. It's taking place within the individual. I am speaking now to this conscious, reasoning mind below, this garment of flesh and blood. You are from below. I am from above. I must be born from above. You, Neville, the flesh and blood Neville, you were born from below, from the womb of a woman. I am being born from above, from that place where they laid me, when I died. I died as God, to awake in man as man, and then to take that man in whom I am buried, and raise him to the level of myself as God. 
He is buried in your skull. That is Golgotha. There is no other burial place for Jesus Christ. You can go all over the world looking for his so-called holy sepulchre. You will not find it outside of your own skull. That's where he's buried. And the day will come that you will find yourself awakening. You will awaken in your own skull and you will be alone. All alone. And the skull will be sealed. Completely sealed. But you now, having awakened within your skull, you have an innate wisdom as to what you should do. For you have one consuming desire and that is to get out. You are completely sealed in your skull and you're standing up alone. But you know if you push the base of your skull, something will give. And you do, you push it from within and something rolls away. As described in scripture, and the stone was rolled away. You do it. And then you put your head through that little opening and you squeeze and you come out like a child being born, inch by inch by inch. And when you are almost out, you pull the remaining portion of your body out of your skull. And after a few seconds on the ground, you rise again and look back at that body out of which you came. It's ghastly pale, tossing its head from side to side, just like one in recovery from some great or major operation. Then you hear the wind that actually preceded the entire drama, a peculiar unearthly wind. Now wind and spirit are the same word in both Greek and Hebrew. But you hear the wind, it's a storm wind. You feel it in your head, and what you seem to feel is coming from the corner of the room where you find yourself. You look over to that corner, not more than a few seconds, and as you look back, the body out of which you emerge has been removed. As told in scripture, they have taken away his body and we do not know where they have made it. The body is gone, it's been removed. But in its place now are seated three witnesses to the event. In my own case, there were my three older brothers. As tradition has it, it is not in scripture. But tradition has it the three who came to witness the birth were brothers. King of Arabia, King of Persia, King of India. And they were brothers. In my case, there are no earthly kings in my family. They were simply my own wonderful loving brothers. And there they sat, one at the head, one at one foot, and one at the other. The body is gone, but that's where they would have been had they remain, had remained there the head and the two feet. They are equally disturbed because of the wind. My brother Lawrence was the most disturbed. And he rose and started towards the same direction where I started. He hadn't gone more than a step when something attracted his attention. And he looked down on the floor and he announced to my other two brothers why it is Neville's baby. They, in the most incredulous voices, ask, how can Neville have a baby? He does not argue the point. He lifts the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and brings it over and places it on the bed. He didn't see me because I am now spirit. I cannot be seen by mortal eyes. They saw it and they came and saw the sign that was foretold by the angel. Go, and you shall find this as a sign, an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes, and that's the sign that God himself was born. For a Savior was born this day to you, and the only Savior in Scripture is the Lord God Jehovah. I am the Lord God, your Savior, you're told in the 43rd and 45th chapters of Isaiah. And beside me there is no Savior. So the Savior is being born. 
That's exactly what's going to happen to you individually. I took the infant up, and then I looked into its face, and I said, How is my sweetheart? Then it broke into the most glorious heavenly smile. I told you the name was called Isaac, which simply means he smiled. The smile is a heavenly smile, and while he's looking to my face and smiling, the whole thing dissolves. Now we come to that second youth. And it comes, in my case, 129 days after the birth from above. An explosion in my head. All, the whole drama takes place in your skull. That's where you are buried, and that's where the whole drama is going to unfold. 129 days later, my head began with a vibration. And when it reached the limit, I thought it was the limit, it exploded. And then when the whole thing settled, I'm seated at an ordinary table. Before me is a table. On it, an enormous head, severed from the body. Leaning against the side of an open door, and looking out on a pastoral scene, is my son David of biblical fame. Yes, David of biblical fame. That's why I say the drama is permanent and continuous. It's not something that took place once and for all, 2,000 years ago, or 4,000 years ago, it is taking place now. And it will continue to take place until his purpose is fulfilled. It cannot be fulfilled until everyone experiences that predetermined drama for the awakening of God in man as God. That man in whom he awakes is God. So here is David, leaning against the side of an open door, and then looking at him. I have never seen such beauty in my life. David has an unearthly beauty. You can't describe the beauty of that land, about 12 or 13. And while I drink him in and feast upon his beauty, the whole thing dissolves. And I know I am his father, and he knows that he is my son. Until that moment in time, I had no idea there was any relationship between a biblical character and the one talking to you now. It came as a complete surprise to me that the story told in the Bible is eternally true, and it's all about us. That David is your son, but you do not know it. He put that in your mind in the beginning, but so that you cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. That 11th verse of the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, that's what he put in your mind. That's that second youth who is over all of us. As you're told, he is prince forever. If he is prince, his father is king. And the Lord will be king in that day. And his name shall be one, and all will be one. He is king, and the king has a son, the son is a prince, and David is the prince forever and forever. So here is the unfolding drama of God in you, and God is king. But he's a father, and because he's a father, there must be a son, and the son is David. So now we'll read in the story of David. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. And now the Lord speaks, I have found David. And he has cried unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. You will find David. And only when you find him will you really know that you are God. You will not in eternity be persuaded by someone other than yourself. You could only know it, actually know it, by finding David. And David will reveal to you who you are. That was God's plan in the beginning. That's his purpose. So he set it forth in Christ. For the word Christ is the Hebrew word Messiah. 
that wonderful poem of Brahm, when he tried in his wonderful manner, and to use the word, to reveal the coming of Messiah, and he called the poem Saul. If you're familiar with the story, Saul was insane, King Saul. And David played the lyre, played the harp, and soothed him when he was demented. Now the story as Brahmin tells it is this. Saul sang before, that is David sang before Saul. And he said to Saul, 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 a face like my face receives you. A man like to me thou shalt love, and be loved by forever. A hand like this hand shall throw open the gates of new life to me. And standing before him he said, See, for Christ stands. He's telling you who he is, he is the anointed one. Christ means the anointed one. Rise and anoint him. This is he, said the Lord to his prophet Samuel. This is he, of who was he speaking to? To Samuel, of whom he spoke of David. So Samuel took the anointment, that is the oil, the precious oil, and anointed David in the presence of his brother. And from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. Now you are told, those who come later will find no joy in them. They are so eager to make money, so eager to get a name among shadows, so eager to build monuments to themselves, they have no time for the story. It's all about the shadow world. And what does he mean he was about all of them? Well, if you can take it, may I tell you, all these garments are shadows. They're part of the eternal structure of the universe. You are wearing these garments, and they are you only for a temporary point of your time. They became a part of you when you penetrated them and annexed the brains of them. And so for a little while they are a temporary portion of the soul, but only for a temporary part of your journey. It is not you. These garments, you burn them up, put them in the, the oven, reduce them to ash. But that's not you. Throw it into the furnace, and that fourth one comes out. The fourth one being your eternal being, as you're told in the book of Daniel. Throw them into the furnace, reduce them to ashes. But here is the immortal you that cannot die. But while you're here, you're so part of the little world in which you live, you think it is you and will die to protect it and do anything to save it while you go about your business trying to make more and more of the shadow world. If those who will come later will not rejoice in him, is that not a striving out to win? Just like striving out to win to build up more and more of the same shadow. So here, I am sharing with you what I personally have experienced. All the adumbrations of the Old Testament, which are put into form as a, as a story told as if it were true. Well, that's what it's told. It's told as if it were true. And you are taught to believe that it was physically true. And it's not physically true. It takes place in man. It is more true than any physical story ever could be, for this is eternally true. Now the third one, you will find yourself, and this is a marvelous one. The day will come you will be split in two, from top to bottom. And you will see at the base of your spine, golden, liquid, pulsing, living light. Although it's liquid, pulsing light, you know it is yourself. And you fuse with it. And then like a fiery serpent, you rise into your star. And when you enter, it is just like thunder. You reverberate 
The whole head begins one grand, marvelous reverberation. You think it's going to split, but no, it subsides, and you have gone back into heaven. That's how you take heaven, and you take it violently, as told you in Scripture. And then comes the climax, and the climax is when the Spirit descends upon you in bodily form as a dove and smothers you with affection, kissing you all over your face, your head, your neck. He remains on you when the vision begins to fade. And then the drama has been brought to its climax. You then tell it to the best of your ability, either in the spoken word as I am, or you can write it, if you can write, but you tell it to anyone who will listen. It's not very encouraging if you read the end of Acts because he told it from morning to evening. Some believed him, and some disbelieved him. But the same thing is true here. Because man has been taught to believe it is a physical story, a secular story. When I tell you the true meaning of it, then they turn their ears, that is, they cast their hands over their ears. For they can't believe that what they were told was not true secularly. And I tell you, it is not historically true. If by history, I mean things that took place here on earth. But it is eternally true in the spirit world. And that's what's going to happen to you. And when it happens to you, you will leave this world. And the next time you close your eyes and men call you dead, you'll be one of those who look down from eternity upon this world and see all this taking place and it's all under you. That's what he meant. I saw all those who go about under the sun and he was over all of them. All these things are simply under his control. Everything here is taking place by those who contemplate it about him. So then you're told in the story he stood before the judge. And the judge says, Who are you? He said, For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. He said, Are you a king? He said, You say that I am. But my kingdom is not of this world. As the thing to do with this world, he came only to bear witness to the truth. And the truth was the word of God. And so he came to express that word. And the word had to find expression in him. And then he tells it to the world. Some believe and some disbelieve. There is no personal description of Jesus in the scriptures. So forget all the pictures that you see. No matter how good the artist, no personal description of Jesus in the Bible, because you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And the day will come, they will know you to be Jesus Christ, regardless of your sex, and they will know you, identified as you are. You're Mary, you're John, you're Jim, you're Stanley, you're Benny, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll know you as their friends, and still know that you are the Lord. For everyone will be the Lord Jesus Christ, and all form one body, one spirit, one God and Father of all, without loss of identity. You are individualized, and you came forever and forever towards an ever greater individualization. You reach that climax of it all, as what you are, the individual, but as the Lord. And they will see you and know that you are the Lord. While you are walking this earth, may I tell you, not in some after-death state. <laughs> when this thing happens to you, there are those in your circle of friends who will see you, and they can't believe their own eyes, but they can't deny what they saw. They will know you are the Lord. Dine with you the next night, have a drink with you, tell you a joke, you tell them one, and still they can't get it out of their head, they saw you and you were the Lord. 
They know that you are the Lord. And yet you're the same thing that they've always done. But they saw you as you really are after you've been born from above. So man must be born from above or he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But everyone who will be born from above, for that one to be born is already in man dreaming. The dreamer in man is Jesus Christ. You are dreaming this world. Now dream it noble. Dream noble dreams all can come to pass. In your dreams dare to assume that you are the man that you want to be. Assume that you are and persist in that assumption. And that assumption in a way you do not consciously know will harden into fact. All assumptions if persisted in become what the world calls reality. But do not give up the most fantastic dream can become true if you assume it and walk in the assumption as though it were true. Night after night, speak as though you are the man, the woman that you would be, or yet you would best be. And then, tomorrow, but I'll bring it to pass, doesn't matter. There are intervals of time between the assumption and its fulfillment. It's like gestation. And so you dare to assume it, give it time. And then some bridge of infinity will be built for you without your conscious knowledge of it. And it will lead you across that bridge to the fulfillment of your assumption in a way that you do not know. <coughs> but dare to assume a noble concept of yourself. Live in it as though it were true. And may I tell you, it will become true. A lady wrote me this week and asked me if I could throw some light on this. She said, I found myself in a dormitory. <coughs> I recall the dormitory, for I was in that school from the age of 12 to 18. But here you are as an instructor, and you are teaching all of us how to solve puzzles. You did not actually do it for us. You allowed us to use our own talent. But you are instructing. You were the instructor teaching us how to solve puzzles, giving us full freedom to make our own efforts. Then you sat next to me, and you asked me this. This puzzles me because I do not understand what it means. You ask me, do you know what 27 is? Do you know what 27 is? I, mean, I do not, and I can't throw any light on it whatsoever. If you can throw some light on it, please do. Well, there are 22 letters to the Hebrew alphabet, but really there are 27 for the five finals. 22 original, but five are repeated and called final for the 27 letter. I will suggest to this lady to read the 27th Psalm tonight. Take the 8th verse. It's a glorious psalm. It is not long, a very short one. Thou hast said to me, Seek ye my faith. My heart says to thee, Thy faith, Lord, I seek. Hide not thy faith from me. That's the whole drama. The Father and the Son. For no one can reveal the Father but the Son. And this is the Son, David, speaking. He's speaking to his Father. Hide not thy faith from me. Yet you told me to seek your faith. My heart says to you, Thy faith, O Lord. I seek, I not thy faith from me. That's the drama. Now in her letter she said, recently I've been having these dreams. Where well, I know I'm dreaming. And I'm trying so hard to see, I'm seeing, but I know I can open my eyes and see differently. But I'm struggling to open the eyes. And they won't open. You're actually on the verge of it, my dear. You must open the incurrent eye. Because you're going to see inwards into the world of thought, into eternity. That which is ever expanding in the bosom of God, what is it? The human imagination. As someone wrote, they had their ears pierced, not the lobes of the ear, 
That's the very center of the meal. Yes, they must be first too. I'll tell you in the 40th Psalm. Ere thou hast cared for me, you made holes in them that I may hear the heavenly sphere. We only hear the sounds and hear the noises. But they are ears to be pierced, and their eyes to be opened. The incurrent eyes opens up into the world of eternity, into the world of thought. And it will ever expand when that eye is the human imagination, which is one with God. For man is all imagination, and God is man, and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And that is God in touch. So be careful what you imagine. I don't care how trivial it is, it's going to come to pass. The whole vast world is nothing more than the confused imaginations of men and women. But it seems confused, well, because man is not in control of his imaginal act. He thinks he can imagine anything with impunity. But he cannot. It all comes into the world to confront him and to show him what his harvest is. He planted it somewhere along the way, and now here comes his harvest, and he doesn't recognize his own harvest. Now, this being my last night, I have no plans for the future. I'm going to give you a full opportunity to ask questions. First of all, let us go into the silence. any question. Now don't be embarrassed. This is my last night here. And so take full advantage of it. The question is, uh, you'll find it at the end of the Gospel of John. When you ask Peter if he loves you. Peter, lovest thou me? And he said, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I do. And he repeats this question three times, and it annoys Peter at the end. That's the story. I can say in words that I love you. I want it carried to the depth of your own being. And so I repeat it. I repeat myself a night after night after night. Because people, I think, hurt me. And then I discover they didn't really. If they had heard me to the point of belief, they would live by it. Because man lives by his beliefs. And when I find them not living by what they confess in words that they believe, I know they didn't really believe it at all. Because man lives by belief. And when I say, well, do you believe it? Do you really believe what I have told you is true? That I was born from above? Do you really believe that David is my son and he is the son of God and therefore he revealed to me who I really am as against what I thought I was? You may say in words, yes, I believe you and then I may find you after that disbelieving by your behavior. And so at the very end he asked it three times. And you'll find a word that he used as love. There are different words. Eros is love on the lowest level. And man mistakes that for love. Agape, that's love. And entirely different. And so man thinks that sex, or I don't have to be sex, sex is a very important thing in this world. Very important. He will say, I love you, meaning sex. Others, an entirely different emotion permeates them. I stood in the presence of infinite love for this man. But there was no feeling of sex about it. He embraced me, our bodies became one body. He refused. 
But I answered his question, says, what is the greatest thing in the world? And I answered, faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And that he embraced them. Now two bodies became one body. As we're told in scripture, the two shall be one. But on this level, sex plays a very important part. But the day will come, the bodies will be split in two from top to bottom. And that energy that breaks into generation will be reversed and move into regeneration. So he asked the question at the very end of the drama. Now let me make the statement. When I said he asked the question, the Gospels are written by anonymous characters. No one knows who Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are. No one. They are anonymous names. They were only relating their own experience. But they told it in the form of a story. It is an allegory. But an allegory is a story told as if it were true leaving the one who reads it or who hears it to discover its hidden meaning and learn its truth. So they related their own experience, whoever Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were. And so they took the name because the name in Scripture has great significance. It's not just a title or a, say, some little tag. No, the name Jesus is the same as the word Jehovah. Same Yahweh thou begins both words. The root is the same root. And Jehovah is salvation. Jesus is called the Savior. That's salvation. And so the Savior was born. Jehovah was born. In a man. And they related their own experience. And told it beautifully. But truth embodied in a tale shall enter in at lowly doors. So they told it in the form of a story that it may be accepted that way, and then gradually, as you accept it, it will unfold within you in its true form. For Peter was the one who denied him three times before the cock crowed. So he's taking other, I wouldn't say, of a chance. He's still reminding him that he did at the very last denying him. Turn your back upon him three times. And I told you the cock would not crow until you denied me three times. And then the third time you wept bitterly because you knew how prophetically true my words were. And so man was swear, I will live by this for the rest of my days. All right. You don't have to swear. Try it. Try living by it. It's not the easiest thing in the world to watch one's imagination morning to the night and to actually control it as you would a boat at sea and you steer it in the direction you want it to go. But it has to be done eventually before you get started now. If you say you love me, you will keep my word, he said. But Peter said, you know I love you. Well, the only way you can love me is to obey the word. Those who love me, he said, obey the word. What must I do to be doing the work of God? Believe in him who he has sent. Well, the only thing you can believe in, but a little man, no, believe in the teaching. For he tells you they aren't my words, but the words of him who sent me. And so, if you really believe that, you believe the words and live by them. But he asked it three times. Just as Peter denied him three times. Any other questions, please? Listen. Well, that was a, a colored man in Barbados. His name was Jordan. I was a boy, but I didn't know this story until I was in my twenties. He was never told me. But I'm one of nine brothers and one sister. My brother Victor met the prophet Jordan. He was known as the prophet. He was a light skin, well, he was a mulatto. A 
And everyone looked upon him as one who really had the prophetic vision. And he met my brother, Dick. And he said to Dick, he said, what number are you in the Goddard family? And Dick said, I am the second. He said, now what do you want to be? He said, well, I want to be a businessman. He said to my brother, Victor, you're going to be a very, very successful businessman. Now he said, what does the third one want to be? That was my brother, Lawrence. He said, he wants to be a doctor. And he said, he will be a very good, successful doctor. And he said, don't touch the fourth one. He belongs to God. The Lord has sent him to do a definite work, so don't touch him. You can't persuade him to do anything outside of that work that God sent him to do.